The Panthers are your 2024 Stanley Cup champs. How close are the Maple Leafs to getting to that level? We'll try to answer that question and more on today's edition of the Locked On Leafs podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network. It's your team every day. Your Locked On Maple Leafs, your daily podcast on the Toronto Maple Leafs. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hello and welcome into the Locked On Leafs podcast, a daily Maple Leafs centric podcast hosted by myself, Mike DeSefano, and my co-host, Dave Morissuti. Today's episode is brought to you by FanDuel. Make every moment more. As playoffs wind down, the sports stop sporting like we want them to, but the summer this summer, FanDuel is hooking up all customers with a boost or a bonus daily. That's right. There's something for everyone every day, all summer long. So visit FanDuel.com slash locked on to get started. Well, you can rip up that Sergei Bobrovsky ticket, but you can cash your Florida Panthers tickets if anyone had any out there because they got it done. They avoided the biggest collapse in NHL history, and they defeat the Edmonton Oilers 2-1 to one to win the Stanley Cup. Great game, Dave. Like, despite oh, yeah. the outcome, like, you know, what, what, whether, whether you wanted Edmonton to win or not, it, it, both teams gave us just a tremendous game, great theater. It turned out to be an outstanding series, Dave. It did. It was competitive. The games were pretty close, minus game four. <laughs> Um, I guess maybe game four and six, but yeah, five on five, both teams were, I'd say pretty equal. And, you know, you saw, especially in that third period, how badly those teams wanted it. Like I, I thought maybe they, they, some of those players weren't going to make it off the, like, we're not going to be able to make a celebration with the way that that throwing themselves out there. Like, I think there was that one chance where McDavid cut into the middle Bobrovsky's on his back. I thought he was scoring there, and he actually saved it. I don't know if you saw a his side angle. just got yeah. a piece of the puck. I know. I saw it on the replay. I was like, oh, my. Like, how? Like, McDavid would have got that off just a half a second sooner. Like, he ends up getting stick-checked and doesn't really get the shot off. And then I think Hyman kind of followed it up with a shot. And, yeah, goes off of Bobrovsky. I think, like, Luce Dorianen came and, like, jumped in front of the puck, too, or one of the defensemen. Forcing maybe jumped in front of the puck and it, it, but that's what it's all about, right? When you get to that point, when you're nursing a two one lead in the Stanley Cup final, you're throwing your body at any puck you possibly can to make sure that that bad boy doesn't get on net or end up in the back of the net. Um, and, and that's exactly what Florida was doing last night. And you know, credit to Edmonton, they were doing the same thing, but you know, I felt Florida, especially in the third period really, really buckled down. They were relentless on their forecheck, relentless on their back check, and they really muddied up the middle of the ice. Like Edmonton couldn't get much through. Like they were trying to work the puck into the middle and get some get something or even try and shoot the puck on net with traffic and try and get a deflection. But Florida wasn't allowing it. They they, you know, were clearing out the net front pretty well the entire night. And uh, you know, a lot of a lot of outside perimeter play from the Edmonton Oilers. And you know, they, they talked about it a lot on the broadcast where it, it looks like maybe they just ran out of gas. And that's somewhat a sign of that happening when guys just simply can't fight anymore in front of the net. And, and uh, you know, it's it, it's it, it still turned out to be a terrific game, though. Um, and, you know, we're going to make things leafy because that's what we do here on the Locked on Lease podcast. But I couldn't help but, like, watch that game and think to myself, boy, this is such a leafy ending for the Edmonton Oilers. Like, let me let me put this into perspective for you and all the Leaf fans listening out here. Tell me if you've heard this story. Put themselves in a hole, nearly climbed out, but came up one goal short in a 2-1 Game 7 loss. Pretty sure that happened this year to the Toronto Maple Leafs. Did it not? It's happened th- countless times to the Toronto Maple Leafs. It's also happened against a Russian goaltender who yeah. did. Yes, exactly. <laughs> it has also happened there. Um, they got good goaltending, but it wasn't better than the goalie on the other side. Usually happens with the Maple yeah. Leafs. They've had good goaltending, 
But unfortunately, the guy on the other side has been Vasilevsky or Bobrovsky or Jeremy Swayman. Like, it's just been unbelievable on the other side, no matter how good, you know, Jack Campbell or uh, Joseph Wall or Samsonov had been. Um, here's a here's the biggest one, though. The big boys didn't get it going when when they really needed them. Right. Like in the game, game six and seven. Dry side on McDavid combined for one point. McDavid held off the score sheet the last two games. Dry Saddle got one assist in game six. So the last two games, McDavid and Dry Saddle held basically pointless, just one point between the two. Um, Dry Saddle just three points in the seven game series. Pretty sure that matches what Mitch Marner did in the seven game series against the uh the the uh Boston Bruins. And then Connor McDavid, yes, he got eleven points. Eight of them came in two games, which means he only had three points in the other five games. So, you know, when we talk about Toronto and and what the big difference is between them succeeding and losing, really, it's often the big boys haven't been able to to, to get it done and fill the net. When that didn't happen, the Oilers didn't really win. When McDavid went legend mode and he had those back-to-back four-point nights, Mm -hmm. They won both of those games, Dave. They won both of those games. But when they were quiet, um, often, you know, the L's piled up for them. And that's what ultimately happened again in game seven, both of them uh, off the score sheet. And then the last one that was very reminiscent to watch in the Maple Leafs this postseason, the power play wasn't good. You do like a power play, which was number one in the league, number one all the way through the playoffs up until the cup final, and then goes pretty sleepy and silent. Uh, once they get uh, get in there, and, and Florida did a, a great job, obviously neutralizing that power play. But again, like McDavid last night, you listened to him post game, and he said, "If we would have scored on that power play, you know, we, we we were right there, we were close. Just that power play could have been our chance to get back into the game. We couldn't do it." How many times did we sit here and bitch and moan about the the lack of offense from that power play yeah. from the Toronto Maple Leafs? That was four percent. Um, yeah, I think I, I I think they had what three power play goals in the whole series. I want to say Edmonton, they were like three for twenty three or something like that, three for twenty four. So uh, a little bit better, but not good enough. Not to you know, this is a team that needs to rely on a strong power play, and they couldn't really get it done. So I, I thought that it was just kind of a very similar storyline to to uh, the a lot of the losses that the Leafs have had over the last couple of years is very reminiscent to uh, to what we saw happen with, with Edmonton and the reason why they ended up going home without Lord Stanley. Yeah, I mean, again, you know, I, their penalty kill was one of the best in the playoffs. But yeah, penalty kill was great. Yeah, Like that, that's probably, that's what kept them in this, in, in a lot of games in these playoffs was their ability to, I think what, they only allowed one goal on the power play in this series. Uh, yeah. So, like I, I think if you're if you're the Leafs, that's one thing you got to take a note of is maybe get a power, penalty kill that actually can kill penalties. Well, it, uh, I remember Craig Button said this uh, maybe about a, a month or month or a half, maybe six weeks before the the playoffs. I remember he said a bad power play won't sink you in the playoffs, but a bad penalty kill will. Because yeah. bad power play, okay, so you're not scoring on your power play, that's fine. But if you got a bad penalty kill. Now you basically start the game down one nothing because you know you're giving up a goal, and you know so that that was a big difference between Edmonton and Toronto. I think that really was right. You know, special teams were a big thing, and you look at the goaltending too. Yeah, I know you're, you're... <laughs> Tuesday, Tuesday. Sorry, <laughs> Continue. of course, and it happens on a Tuesday as well. That's hey, hey, let's go. Didn't even plan it that way. Nope, not at all. And so, like, th- that's the thing, right? When you look at how both these teams played, I, I think the Leafs tried to do some of that, but that that culture wasn't ingrained in them during the regular season. Now, Edmonton, a little bit of that did come about during the playoffs. Like, their penalty kill got to that level eventually. It wasn't like that all season long, of mm-hmm. course. Um, But when you look at even – you talked about it, like, Florida – the ability to just shut down the top guys, especially at home, like that Ekblad Forsling pairing, was nails in Game Seven. 
Like Eckblad was literally like holding McDavid's leg up in the air. I, I, I don't know what he was trying to do there, but like <laughs> he, he was basically like, I'm not letting this guy score tonight. Yeah. Hey, mission accomplished. Yeah. Right. Mission accomplished. And, uh, you know, they end up with Lord Stanley and I don't know. I, I'm sure you were watching the, the celebrations and all the interviews like I was last night, but, uh, I gotta tell you one, one of the few moments that like tugged at the heartstrings, you know, watching Paul Maurice, Finally put the cup over his head, former Maple Leafs head coach, might add. Uh, but Paul Murray's finally getting it done after 30 years behind the bench. Um, you know, and then he he had uh, a great, great post game comment with uh, Kyle Bukowskis where he was talking about, you know, how his dad's name is now going to be on the cup alongside, you know, the Ted Lindsay's, the John Bellavos. And then he said, now Maurice will be on the on the, on the Stanley Cup. And. It just tugged at my heartstring, man. Like I, I love Paul Maurice. I think he's such a fantastic human being. You could tell the way that that Florida really buys in. And when you listen to, you know, yesterday, even Sam Reinhart was talking about how he's never seen a team compete so hard for someone. And and the guy at the top that cultivates the culture is Paul Maurice. And you know, no one could say enough good things about him if they play for him. And, uh, you know, he's he's so good with the media. He's always so he's funny. He's thoughtful. He gives very, um, you know, uh, out, tells great stories. Uh, and, and now he can finally tell people he's a Stanley Cup champion. So of all the people that I was happy for, uh, Paul Maurice was one of them from the Florida Panthers that he was able to put the pot, the, the cup over his head. Kyle Pozo, you know, I, I'm really happy for that guy. Just someone who's been in the league. For a very long time, ended up getting he held the cup third. He was the third guy to get the cup. So Barkov gave it to Bobrovsky, who then gave it to, uh, to Kalak Pozo. Um, I think that's probably his last game. Also, just as an aside, go out on top, a Stanley Cup champion. Um, anything from post game celebrations that uh, that stuck out to you? I mean, the Paul Maurice, uh, the way he was talking about his family and stuff, yeah. and then at the very end, it's like. I want the Winnipeg Jets to win the next cup. And I was like, yeah, yeah, wow. that was surprising. The Jets got a shout out. The Canucks got a shout out from Roberto Luongo. Also, as like a massive Luongo fan, like I I, I loved Luongo growing up. I, he was always my favorite goalie. Um, watching him finally win a Stanley Cup actually was was pretty cool. Uh, I, I love that. Um, but then, yeah, he gave a shout out to Vancouver and then. He, uh, Makachuk gave a shout out and said, can't wait to see Brady win one of these one day. So Ottawa kind of got a little sh shout out too. So uh, funny enough, this, uh, you know, it looks like Florida might've been Canada's team all along. looks like they all want to see the great success throughout. Uh, no, I'm, no, we have a shout out to Toronto though. Notice that. No, oh. no. Carter Verhage couldn't have said, I want to thank the Maple Leafs for drafting me and allowing me to, you know, develop. And then, mm -hmm. you know, sent me where I needed to go to get better, blah, blah, blah. No, nothing. No. I, and on top of that, the um, me, Matt Kachuk also to my Calgary fans, you know, I was never going to let Edmonton win. That yeah, probably that was, was one of my favorite lines. <clears throat> that was funny. That was funny. Did you hear that he? Um, so he he quit drinking. So for the stand, the whole Stanley Cup run, he said, "I I quit drinking. Didn't have a, a single sip of alcohol the entire time." And apparently, he had heard Chris Chelios did that one year, and they won the cup. So he decided he was going to do it. So there was an interview, I think it was with ESPN, and uh, he's sitting there and just like chugging his his beer. And he's like, this is the first sip of alcohol I've had in two months. And he's like, and I'm about to have so much more. Oh, it's it's just, started. He's at no. the elbow room in Florida. Right. On the, like he's he, it's like they've been yeah. probably going. He hasn't gone to good. bed. No. He, he hasn't he hasn't gone to bed. Like that's that's just a, a given. <laughs> that guy and that old team, they have not gone to bed. Uh, but they deserve it, man. The champions. They are Stanley Cup champions. Congratulations once again to the Florida Panthers. Heck of a team. The better team won at the end of the day. And uh the Stanley Cup back in back in the state of Florida for uh for what the, the third time in five years here. Crazy, 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 crazy. Uh all right, on the other side, we'll kind of dive a little bit back into what we were talking about with the Maple Leafs. Uh, and we were saying I was very, very leaf-like how the Oilers lost. Well, what do the Maple Leafs need to do to reach that level of success that the Florida Panthers are currently experiencing? Well, we'll get to that on the other side. We'll also take a look at Stian Solberg as today's draft profile with the draft 
fastly approaching. Quick. It's in four days, Dave. No, three days, technically. Three yeah. days, Dave, we have the draft. Boy, is it going to be a quick turnaround. So get to all that more on the other side. It's Mike Stefano with Dave Morris Studio. You're listening to the Locked On Lease Podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network. Today's episode is brought to you by FanDuel. I love sports. I love them so much. I never want them to stop. But as the playoffs wind down, we get fewer games. And the sports aren't sportsing like they used to. Uh, FanDuel lets me keep the sports going whenever I want. All I have to do is open up the app and dream up of bets anytime I'm in the mood. And this summer, FanDuel is hooking up all customers with a boost or a bonus daily. That's right. There's something for everyone. All summer long, you still got the Blue Jays in play. I know it's been pretty putrid to watch that team last night, but you can still bet on them. You can even fade the Blue Jays if you really feel like things are not going to be going well for them. They got the the Boston Red Sox next couple of games. So head over to FanDuel.com slash locked on and start making the most of your summer. FanDuel, official sports betting partner of Major League Baseball. Welcome back into the Locked On at Leafs podcast. Mike DiStefano and Dave Morissuti with you as we are each and every weekday here on the Locked On at Leafs podcast. You can find it wherever you get your podcast from. And you can also find us up on YouTube. All right. So the Florida Panthers about to, uh, uh, they they're probably are still out there partying. Like I doubt they went to bed. Um, and I, I mean, they're probably going to have a heck of a party. Uh, what will the Maple Leafs need to do to get to this level though, Dave? Like when you sit back, you watch the playoffs, you reflect, all right, this is where the Leafs are at. How do they get to where Florida is? Like how, what do they need to do to reach that level? Well, you're talking about the party. I'm just literally seeing a video on X right now of Matthew Kachuk pouring beer from the Stanley cup over a balcony onto fans drinking. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. there is a party going on in Florida right now, which makes me so envious because, like, you know, Florida's Florida was the deserving team yeah. all year with the way they've played. And you're just like, OK, like what? what and as you said, what the heck do the Leafs need to do to get there? And like you look at what Billy Zito did to make this team into a contender. Right. A couple of years ago, this team wins the president's trophy. This is kind of, that was like their big breakout. Yep. They they fall out of the playoffs when they lost to Tampa. Like it was like such a disaster with the way that that all ended. So then they decided we got a chance to go out and get a Matthew Kachuk. Obviously, there was a bit of a, a bit of luck on their side because Kachuk may, put Florida as one of his destinations. And what did they do? They decided, okay, we really want the player. We're going to make a big shakeup of our core and we're going to trade our leading scorer, Jonathan Huberto and Mackenzie Weger, and then a first round pick Perfect. and another player on top of that. Cole Schwint as well. Right. To get Matthew Kachuk. Like it was a huge, I it's a gamble, right? Matthew Kachuk, obviously that worked out. He was a good player. I don't think there's any issue whether. He was going to be a good player for Florida, but it's like you, those are like significant pieces you took off your team. But those were, he knew that his team needed to play a different way and needed a different type of player. And it went out, they went out and they got that player. Obviously, then they went out and got Sam Bennett. They did uh, Reinhardt as well. I think that was all in the, like, roughly the same. Reinhardt, yeah. Reinhardt was, Reinhardt might have been the year before. Because he was a draft day deal. So he may have been before. But anyways, yeah, all roughly around the same same time period. Um, right. Like those were, yeah, so he, Ryan Hart's been there for three years. Yeah. Um, so, like, but those are the things, right? You know, in a lot of ways, a lot of players that other teams didn't think were going to do much, right? Bennett was one of those guys with Calgary. Ryan Hart with Buffalo. For Haggy. Portland was a, was a waiver. For Haggy. But it was it, it was but it, it really to me also kind of all stemmed from bringing Paul Maurice on board, right? Paul Maurice changed it for you. I think so because like that that team. Uh, why am I blanking on the on the coach? He's with uh, Nashville. Um, Brunette Andrew Brunette, right? Takes over for Quenville, 
They went on that run. And they they become President Trophies winners. And then Maurice comes in, and it's like, okay, our play is going to dip. And it did. They almost didn't make the playoffs last year. But he also got them to play the right way. Yeah. Right. And that, that was it for me, too. It's like Florida finally decided they needed to play the right way. Now, was it sustainable? Well, the first time around, it wasn't. But this time around, like the guys, I think they, they truly bought into what they need to do to win. Right. Mm-hmm. Bar- yeah. <laughs> they, had, they had the foundation too. Barkov, that two way shutdown player, Ekblad, top defenseman, and then Bobrovsky and that. Like they had the pieces. And I think that's a two, right? Do the Leafs have the pieces, the horses to get it done? Clearly, they haven't had the horses to get it done. I think in past years, you could say, you know, losing to Tampa, who went on to win the cup, losing to Boston, who went on uh, went on those runs. Like, I can get that, but you look at where the deficiencies of the roster is, and I don't know if the Leafs had the horses to get the job done. I yeah. Think that's the big one there. So let's break it down a little bit. So, so what do they need then over the next – year season i suppose like i would imagine that they would like to be competitive next year like the i would assume brad tree living is this off season his goal is to build a team that can get to the stanley cup right that quick turnaround yeah. and do that so in order to get there in order to build that roster that is cup ready you know what do they need to do well they've already made the coaching change so yep. perhaps craig berube comes in and he can be that paul maurice type guy veteran who's been there before motivator you know hopefully he can he can be that paul maurice uh, changing coach. So they've already done that, right? Now, yeah. next, you look at what else do they need to to get done? Well, I would say they need a stud goaltender, man. Like I, I know I've been I've been preaching this and I've been beating a dead horse on this topic pretty much throughout the entire entirety of the playoffs. As all we saw going into you know the final four was stud goaltenders leading their teams all the way deep into a finals. And you know I, I guess Stu Skinner is is in a somewhat of a, a tier below, but Stu Skinner didn't didn't win, right? It was Bobrovsky who won, and it was Bobrovsky who stood on his head for a couple of those games uh, to to steal victories for the Florida Panthers. It was Bobrovsky last night who made that unbelievable glove save, um, you know, on Zach Hyman with the, in the last couple of minutes to keep it uh, a one goal game and lead his team to victory. So I, I'm still very much of the belief that I think the Maple Leafs do still need to get themselves a stud goaltender. I know there's this report about. Yeah, uh, Joseph Wall nearing an extension that could be signed on on July first. Uh, you know, somewhere in the the three and a half to four million range on a three year deal. Um, I, I I don't believe, you know that that uh, that they'll be able or that they'll be willing to go out and spend big money on a goaltender if they've got Wool signed for that much money. So that that does kind of worry me a little bit just because not that I don't think Joseph Wool can be a good goaltender. It's just the health is 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 not always there. Like if there's one thing about Bobrovsky, he's had great health his entire career. Like Bobrovsky's actually played. Like, like whether he's played well or not, like he's always kind of been hot season, you know, cold season. Last two have been red hot. Um, he's always been around. He's always played at least and uh, availability is your best ability. That's the one thing that concerns me about the Leafs and goaltending is, okay, you're going to hitch your wagon to Joseph wool. Um, when he's, when he's playing, yeah, he's a good goaltender, but that's the, the key when he is playing. Mm-hmm. Um, so, and, and it came down to a game seven against the Boston Bruins. This guy was nowhere to be found. Tweaked his back at the end of game six. Are you kidding me? <laughs> um, so that's that's like one of the biggest differences when you look at these this team and how they're built on paper. The goaltending isn't even close. It's not close to what what's going on out in Florida um, with with Sergey Bobrovsky, who's been uh, you know the top three goaltender in the in the in the world the last two seasons and what he's been able to do here with the Florida Panthers the last two playoff runs. So. That's kind of for me like the main one of the main differences in the rosters. We talk about roster construction, you know, build from the net out. I think the Maple Leafs need to. It doesn't look like they're going to. It does appear that they're going to be rolling the dice on Joseph Wall, but I, I would prefer, you know, uh, more of an upgrade. I suppose a little bit more stability in goal there uh, going forward. What's another? kind of uh, roster construction piece that sticks out to you that the Maple Leafs kind of need to get themselves cup ready. 
well, it's the blue line, right? Like, you look at this blue line. Yeah, Jake McCabe, good defenseman. Morgan Riley last year in that series against Tampa was that game-changing defenseman. He mm-hmm. wasn't this year. So, I think Morgan Riley, they got to... That's going to probably be one of uh, Craig Ruby's first projects is how do we get more out of Morgan Riley because he's one of the more important defensemen. But after that, it's just like you need to find that partner for Morgan Riley. Like Aaron Ekblad, as good as he was, he was also good because he has Gustav Forsling playing with him, right? Um, you know, you need to go out and find like that Oliver Ekman Larson, that steady de- veteran guy not making too much. I mean, I think probably him just decided to take the one year and play in Florida kind of helped in that regard as well. Um, and a lot of guys seem to want to hitch their wagon to Florida, which makes sense. They were a good team, but I think that's, that's it right there. You need that top four group needs to be bolstered. And I think it needs to be the number one priority. You've got so much invested up front. It's already taken care of. When you look at what the the cap space you have and the needs you have, I still think the blue line is where it needs to needs to go because you need the again when I talk about getting the horses to get the job done, you need it all throughout uh, the lineup, especially on the on the back end. Yeah, I completely agree. I think they still need another top pair defenseman to to pair up with Morgan Riley, and then I still think they need another like additional top four guy. So yeah. I think they need two top four defensemen uh, to put themselves into that conversation. Um, and, and you know, we'll see what they can do. We've heard reports that they are going to be heavily interested in adding two top four defensemen this summer. Brandon Montour has been linked. Uh, Chris Tanev has been linked. Uh, has Brady Shea been linked? I'm trying to remember Brady Shea or if we've just been trying to, to speak that into existence. I can't recall if I've actually seen reports of that one. Um, I haven't seen reports of it, but... No, I, I've heard the Montour and Tana. We heard, yeah, are like kind of the top, the top targets. Target. Yeah, which I don't know. We'll talk about a little bit more this this, this week, I suppose, about uh, about those guys. Uh, at least Montour is bringing bring Cup pedigree if he does come to Toronto. Uh, but we'll we'll get into that in a, in a little bit. And then uh, you know we've talked about it a lot too. Like they they just need an elite third line center. Like that's just kind of what this team has been missing and what they've been lacking. Um, they, they thought they finally brought one in when they got, you know, Ryan O'Reilly, uh, and, and, you know, they were just unable to, uh, to, to beat Florida last year. He, he ended up getting hurt, which was a big difference of that team. But I think that that's another kind of area that, you know, the Leafs just, the, 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 the lack of depth down the middle, uh, is, is kind of what did this team in, um, and, and a guy who, can shut down the opposition, right? Like a, just a, a two way guy. And, you know, we, we brought up Chandler Stevenson as a, as a possibility this, this summer uh, we've brought up uh, maybe a, a Sean Monaghan potentially like there, there are some players, but maybe you go the trade route. But I do think that in order to put yourself into cup contention, like David camp just isn't going to get it done. Right. Max Domi is a third line center is not going to get it done. So, you know, I, I do believe that uh, in order for this team to take those next steps, those are probably the the three, you know, upgrades that I think this team needs to make. They got to get themselves a goaltender, got to get themselves a couple of, of, you know, top four defensemen to round out that blue line. And then, you know, an elite third line center, uh, a two way guy is, is kind of what they need. Um, and, and most importantly, though, honestly, Dave, like, I don't think they're that far away. I will say that, um, like, if you look at what the, Edmonton Oilers and the Toronto Maple Leafs, you do like the 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 whiteboard matchup. They're pretty close. Like also, like Cody Cece played what like 20 something minutes last night. Like <laughs> it's not like Edmonton's got a, a, an outstanding blue line, but no. what was the difference between what the Oilers did and what the Maple Leafs don't do every year? The Edmonton Oilers stars showed up for them and brought them to a Stanley Cup. It dried up in the final, and then that's why they ended up with the result that they had but they brought them and dragged them to a cup. Their star, Car McDavid, dragged them to a Stanley Cup game seven. We do know that. So they need the stars to finally show up. That's probably the biggest difference um, of, of them being a cup contender and being a first-round elimination every single year except the last. Uh, so that is 
probably first and foremost, the biggest change that the team needs to make. They got to get their stars going and they got to show up come playoff time. No more, you know, three points and outs in seven games. Nonsense. That just it's 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 not good enough for people who are asking for 12, 12 and a half million bucks. So that is probably like number one. Let's get the stars going and earning their paychecks, guys. Earn the earn the checks. Yeah, no, that's it. <laughs> your your stars need to be your stars. Uh, I, I'm just when you look at the Panthers, their stars were their stars. When you look at Edmonton, like I would love for Toronto's stars to be near the top of the scoring race in the playoffs. That hasn't happened, no. right? That need like that's what they're that's what they're being paid to do. Um, it doesn't have to be pretty. I think that's it too. It doesn't need to be pretty. McDavid makes everything pretty. That's just his. He can do it. He's Connor McDavid. The Leafs are going to need their stars to d- just buckle down and play the way they need to play. Make even if it has to be simple, just get the job done. Yep, absolutely. So we'll see, man. It's uh, it's going to be a pivotal off season for the Maple Leafs. There's a lot of decisions that need to be made. Obviously, with some of the key, you know, extensions that possibly could come into into play this summer. Um, and if they don't, how else does this team make change? So it'll be a great uh, off season. It, it, we'll be following it, covering it daily for sure here, Dave. Um, okay, really quickly, actually, let's let's break and come back, and then we've got to quickly touch on uh, you know t- today's draft target. We're going through our top five Leaf draft targets, uh, so we'll do that on the other side, real quick. It's Mike DiStefano, Dave Morissuti. You're listening to the Lockdown Leafs Podcast, part of the Lockdown Podcast Network. It's your team every day. Welcome back into the Lockdown at Leafs Podcast. Mike DiStefano, Dave Morissuti with you here. And, uh, well, the season's over. It's come to a close. The hockey year uh, is officially done. And off-season mode, silly season, uh, is now in full gear. I expect the next couple of weeks to be very, like the next week, to be insanely busy. Like, uh, insanely busy. We we saw a trade happen, a literal trade happen. Dave's just on on mute or something. I think he, he'll come back. But uh, we just saw a trade happen, like, right before puck drop. The Ottawa Senators and Boston Bruins strike on a deal that saw Linus Allmark go to Ottawa for a first-round pick, which is 24th overall. Uh, Jonas Corpusalo, who's retained at 25%, and uh, Mark Kastelich. All three of those going over to to Boston. Linus Allmark going to to Ottawa. So they get their goaltender. Um, so they finally shored things up in net. So they think, uh, I suppose. They also thought they did that with Jonas Corpusalo. But silly season is here. Right, saw it happen right before, right before puck drop in Game Seven, and I'm sure it will continue on until the draft on Friday, and then uh, from Friday through through Monday on Canada Day, July one. I'm sure there'll be plenty, plenty more deals that will be made. So with silly season officially here, uh, I'm I'm excited. The Leafs haven't made a whole lot of moves like since the year ended too, and I I expect for them to get active and, and give us some stuff to report on and talk about over the next little bit. Um, but let's get to uh, get to our discussion today about which Leafs draft target we want to do a little bit of a spotlight on. To remind you, the Leafs, uh, well, the draft order is actually now finalized, technically. Um, I think uh, Florida had a couple of, with them winning the cup, there was a couple draft picks that they had yeah. that converted to uh, that upgrade. I think Ottawa gets a third now instead of a fourth for the Tarasenko deal. Mm-hmm. And then Ocpozo, uh for that trade, Buffalo gets a fifth instead of a seventh. So uh, Florida will make those trades all day long uh, and, and those other opposing teams and their fan base is certainly happy with the outcome when it comes to that too. But uh, the Maple Leafs locked and loaded in at pick number 23 and the player that we're going to profile today is Stian Solberg from Norway a Norwegian prospect. And he's kind of been a late riser here in the draft process. He's been playing in Norway but uh, Craig Button kind of rocketed him all the way up his his draft rankings uh, late in the process, and then other people kind of started to take notice in what Stan Solberg is all about. So let me tell you what this cat is. Uh, left shot defenseman, 
Six foot two, 201 pounds at just 18 years old. He had five goals, 10, po- uh, 10 assists, 15 points in the top tier Norwegian league. Uh, he's going to be playing in the SHL this upcoming season. Uh, if he doesn't make the NHL, I suppose that's also a possibility. But he's been loaned out to Farstad, so he'll be playing in the Swedish league as opposed to the Norwegian league. So he'll be playing much stingier competition this year, which should be better for his development. Um, and he was really, really impressive at the NHL Combine for the athletic testing. Did well in his jumping and was number one in both left and right side agility tests at the Combine, which makes me believe that it's possible. Stian Solberg, the way that he's able to move laterally to his left and to his right so cleanly, um, might might be capable of playing both sides of the ice. So as a left shot defenseman, could slide over and, and play on the right side. So that would be uh that'd be a nice little little bonus for uh, for Stian Solberg. Um what kind of excites you about the possibility of Solberg as a prospect, Dave? I mean, he's playing like a pro, right? I mean, he's playing pro, but like at the World Championships, he was he was playing over 20 minutes a game at the World Championships against mm-hmm. top professional players as a 18 year old defenseman, which is not something many teams like to do, but Norway, he's got that opportunity. Uh, just reading some of like the, what the scouts have been saying, you know, as we, you talked about good mobility, likes to play the body, win battles along the boards, just that. I, I think that when you're talking about needing the horses to go out and win in the, you know, in the playoffs, that's, this is the type of player you need. He's got the toughness. He's willing to box out guys in front. Plays with a lot of energy. He, it, it just a lot of those qualities that I think, um, yeah, maybe not the most dynamic offensive player, but I think that's just because of the role he plays. Um, I think Jason Bukla says like he projects him to be like a top four two way de- NHL defenseman. Like, yeah. I, 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 I know if you get someone like that at twenty three, you're pretty happy. Again, I think maybe some similar qualities to EJ Emery in terms of like their, you know, bigger, bigger defensemen. The size is, I think, what makes uh, those guys stand out and just able to play in high leverage situations at such a young age. That's so important. Absolutely. And and this is what uh, Elite Prospects has as their little quick blurb report about Solberg in their draft guide. What defines Solberg above everything else is his mean streak. He's not just content just repelling opponents. He wants them to be as close as possible as it's then easier for him uh, to press his stick into their back. He inflicts pain every chance he gets, immobilizes opponents, and knocks them away from the front of the net. That Love that's 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 he the is blur. the Joel Edmondson of Norway. <laughs> a- apparently, and like at just 18 years old, he's already 6'2, 200 pounds. I think he's got a little bit of growth left in him as well. So uh, he would be a terrific addition. So, you know, the Maple Leafs, we talked about them needing to upgrade on the blue line. There's not much in the pipeline in terms of defensive prospects. Like, yeah, there's Topi Nimala, and and, and they've got, they they now uh, drafted that Noah Chadwick a a year ago. Uh, William Villanova is is a young prospect. Miko Kokonen, you know, a young prospect. But none of those guys really scream like top pair or top four. So Stian Solberg, does have that upside to be a top pair defenseman possibly if all things go well in his development. So, you know, he is a player that I'd be, uh, I'd be excited about if the Maple Leafs end up grabbing him at pick number 23. I think he might be someone who, again, is someone who's risen in the draft rankings um, and, you know, has him in the somewhere in the teens, late teens. So we'll see if he ends up lasting that long. But if they can get one of those two defensemen, our, uh, EJ Emery or Stian Solberg, and the Maple Leafs will be uh, be pretty happy about what uh, prospect they're getting at pick number 23. Uh, all right, Dave. I think that'll do it for us here today. Uh, I'd like to thank everyone for listening and supporting the show. You can subscribe to the Locked On Leafs podcast on all platforms and receive daily Leafs content. Follow myself on X at Mickey underscore Canuck. Follow Dave at D underscore Morris Sudi and follow the show as well at Locked On Leafs. We'll be back with another episode for you guys tomorrow. Start taking a look at what the Leafs could possibly do throughout the offseason. Look at some of the trades leading up to the draft potentially and free agents because free agency is right around the corner. What, six days away? 
It's coming quick. It's coming fast. So we'll get uh, get to all that on tomorrow's show. Until then, keep it locked right here on Locked On Leafs.